folks, we have so much fun on the show here. Thanks for joining us for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. Uh, Forums edition. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Storini in the home game. And I've got the best job in the world because every week I get to hang out here with this gang of uh, recreational poker wizards and just talking about this game that we love so much. Um, So I got to thank Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for making all this possible with their continued support. And I got to thank everyone uh, who's on the Wrecking Crew, who comes to hang out with me every week and talk poker strategy. Um, so Wrecking Crew members, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself to Wreck Poker Nation? Well, I am Chris Jones. I'm 5B5 on Twitter and 5 by 5 5 5 5 on the Poker Stars home game. And I'm John Somsky. I am Poker Geek MN everywhere. Uh, I'm Kim Kilroy. I am Pet Vet, Pet Vet 33 in most places, uh, Fergie 56 in the home game. I'm Rob Washam and I'm Rabman 50 just about everywhere. I'm Taylor Moss. I'm Gopher Boy TJM in the Rec Poker Nightly home game. And you can find me on Twitter at, at Taylor underscore Moss. And I already told you I'm Jim Reed, Bluff Streaming in the home game. And if you want to find out about me, you can go to rec.poker slash crew, and you can see all the different members of the Wrecking Crew, uh, people like Kevin Mathers, Daro Carney, um, Eric Jin, uh, Keith Monkey System Brant. We've got quite a collection of great poker minds over there that you can hang out with by joining our free community at rec.poker. So go do and check that out. Uh, every week, we get to hang out here and talk poker with this group. We take a post from the rec.poker forums and we talk about it here on the air while we're trying to steal chips from each other in the free nightly home game, um, which we're coming up to the end of the season for. In fact, by the time this comes out, I think it will be almost uh, crowning our 2021 champion. How exciting that'll be. Um, so this week, we're looking at a post by Chapo, who's a uh, prolific forum poster. We haven't uh, heard from Chapo in a while, but we got a great one here about a stone cold bubble in a large field MTT. So this is a spot, and if you were listening last week, we were in a position where we were looking at a hand from uh, Jim, and it was also with Jax uh, in, a, in a one flight of a tournament. We were trying to decide what to do with pocket Jax when someone in front of us opens. Uh, this is a kind of a similar situation. In this case, we actually are on the bubble. Uh, we have, I'll just read you what Chapo has to say about the hand here. I have an awkward stack size. And basically what happens is an under the gun uh, player two X's and we have pocket jacks and we have to decide what to do. Um, we don't have the deepest stack at the table. So there are a couple players that cover us. And uh, Chapo says, any other time I three bet pre the problem here is if I three bet, even as small to five big blinds or so, it's borderline to consider a shove. Under the gun could have a strong range, and I figured it best out to be flipping. And I thought it would be a disaster to get into a flip on the stone cold bubble. Yet, if I call with Jack, do I play on with a disguised hand strength preflop? It's a five dollar fifty cent tournament, and uh. It's not a, you know, Chapo is used to playing uh, live events. So before we get to what actually ends up happening, the questions he wants to know are, do you rip it? Do you flat it? Do you fold? And we all know with pocket jacks, there's three ways to play it and they're all wrong. And on this particular flop, which we'll get into later, uh, would it have been a trivial fold? One of his other questions is how important should it be to at least min cash a large field MTT. And I'll start with that answer, which is over the years, for a while, people kind of poo-pooed the min cash because you had to have a winner take all mentality and and really try and chip up for that final table. And you were supposed to be the player that was being aggressive on the bubble while other players weren't. And there's definitely, that, that is generally true. But I think what got lost, and I think people are coming around to this more recently, is that the difference between not cashing and min cashing is actually a big difference. And it's worth preserving your opportunity to make that ladder up. So short answer, I think it's very important. 
to be min caching when you're in a position to do so. Um, but it's just one factor because getting that stack that's going to allow you to finish in the top three is also a really important factor. And it's going to be, you know, the size of your stack as you approach the bubble might have something to do with your decision in that spot, the table you're at, um, the structure of the tournament, the payout structure. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but I think the poker community is coming, kind of coming full circle around to the idea that min caches actually are important to your ROI, uh, especially in the long term, even in a $5.50 tournament. So I know a few of the folks here had a chance to review this while it was uh, in the forums before we took it on the air. But let's just get down to the, the real simple question here, which is, how do you play Jax preflop? Well, I think the, the previous question where you're talking about how important is it to min cash, uh, like the simple answer is like the bigger the field, the more important it is to min cash, right? Because we're talking about a couple like key milestones when you're like playing, like, can you min cash? Can you final table? Can you win the tournament? And in the bigger the tournament, the bigger that gap is between min cash and final tabling. Um, so like, how often are you going to be at a spot where the, the ICM bubble factor that you're under is exactly a two buy-in difference? Usually min cash is about double your buy-in. When else are you going to be at that spot? And it's going to be a while in the tournament until you're under this exact ICM pressure where the next person to bust gets nothing and the person after that gets two more buy-ins. Uh, so it's actually a really big spot. If you're in a smaller tournament where, you know, seven people cash, okay, min caching is a little bit less important because you want to win. Winning is, you know, not that far away and doubling up can be a huge factor. But like right here, if we double up and it's a huge field tournament, it doesn't improve our odds of final tabling by that much. But it does really hurt our chances of potentially cashing if we do take a flip in this spot, because uh, now all of a sudden we're potentially leaving with zero. So regardless of a buy-in of five dollars and fifty cents, there should be a uh, a theory, a thing in your brain that is just absolutely paramount that ICM pressure is huge, and we got to be aware of it. And right now we're under a ton of ICM pressure. Um, I just want to say something about this table that makes a big difference to the way that you would play pocket jacks in this situation. Um, our hero is the second in chips at this table, and there is still a player to act after him that has twice as many chips as the next person on the table. Other, If he was the biggest stack at the table, he could play this as aggressively as he would want to play it. Like he could just shove all in here and he virtually has to make everybody fold except maybe someone would call with aces. But because we have, we have all smaller stacks after us except for one big stack that has us covered that's in the small, it's in the small blind. And that's a really big stack at the table. So we are in the awkward position that if we flat with jacks, that person could just go all in or just raise with any two cards and put huge ICM pressure on both the under the gun raiser who only has 23 big blinds and us with 24 big blinds. But if it, the situation were different, then we could play this jack, these jacks differently. And that's what's so important in these ICM spots is the stack sizes at the table and the stack sizes yet to act after us. Yeah, and we talked last week about how in a similar position, having jacks in a spot where ICM was not much of a factor um, made it a, a pretty uncontroversial shove. Um, and this is a not dissimilar spot. And simply because the ICM is more of a factor, um, you're seeing a lot of the analysis lean towards calling or maybe even folding. Uh, just, just to point out how important that, that ICM pressure can be. Rob, did you have something there? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things to consider when we're on the Stone Cold Bubble. If you are the chip leader, as Kim mentioned, you can put a lot of pressure, especially on the medium stacks. Um, they're going to be they're going to have they're going to have that ICM pressure on them to uh, to fold. If you're uh, if you're in that position, you can put a lot of pressure on people, but at the same time, 
because you're in that position, you can put pressure on people and gain chips and build your stack. So you might not necessarily want the bubble to break. I mean, mm. that's a that's a strategy that as the big stack, you know, you're you're being able to take advantage of those and build your stack prior to the bubble bursting. Once the bubble bursts, all hell breaks loose, as we know. And everybody's going all in with whatever, because now they made the money and let's stack up. So there's a dynamic there that is, is kind of lost sometimes. I don't think people realize that a lot. Me personally, in this particular situation, I think I would three bet with my jacks with the intention of folding to a push by the small blind with somebody with more chips than me. I think we, we have enough chips um, that we can make a three bet, put that pressure on um, the other shorter stacks at the table. If the big stack decides to get involved, we still have enough chips we can fold and still wait for some of those shorter stacks to uh, go out and actually, you know, cash at the bubble. So that would be my play. I would respectively disagree. <laughs> I we love think disagreeing that, here on the show. That's how we get that closer that to truth. If we three bet, that big stack can just go all in over the top of us and force us to fold almost everything we three bet. I think that the best way to play this hand in this spot is either to fold or go all in. I think those mm. are the only two options here because then we take the power away from the big stack. No other stack at the table can knock us out of this tournament. And we're just gambling that that big stack doesn't have a hand. So I don't mind either way because the, yes, it's important to cash, but this is a relatively small min cash. And I think that going all in is a viable option here um, or folding. I don't think we should three bet. It's just too dangerous with that big stack after us. And Kim, if we had a note on the uh, big stack player that they were very straightforward or very passive or something, would that change your analysis? Would you be more inclined to call or make a smaller um, or make or take a different action? Because I know we kind of project on others this kind of, you know, they can make a play here. But sometimes I wonder if, if the player pools that we're actually playing against are going to be taking that kind of savvy, aggressive action with non-premium hand there. Well, I think that that's a danger if we just let them call right. our three bet. Like, I just think that we either gamble that they don't have a hand that they can call a 24 big blind shove with, or we just fold and move on to the next hand. Does anybody like a call here instead? And I know we talk often, this is this Andrew Broca's line that calling is not a compromise. Um, you know, often we're in situations where, you know, raising or folding is best, but we decide to call instead because it's like in the middle. Um, I think sometimes that's the right decision. And sometimes we just kind of fool ourselves into it. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I, I, I would call this sometimes, particularly this, this spot, uh, when we are, um, under this ICM pressure, we are, um, I think if we, if we do three bet this, we're putting ourselves, in a position where, yeah, the big stack, I mean, if the big stack shoves or, or three bets here, I think it's, it's um, a spot where, you know, if we've just called, it's, it's a pretty trivial fold. Um, but if we uh, have three bet now, we've got to really think about how much of, of our sort of dwindling stack have we committed? Um, do we actually need to call off here? We've kind of crippled ourselves. So I, I, this is a spot where I, I do I do find myself flatting um, sometimes with these sort of these kind of hands where um, I, and, and especially if the big stack doesn't then get involved in the hand, um, I'm gonna have the, the biggest stack uh, remaining. And I'm gonna have a pretty easy path to understanding how to approach this hand on future streets. For the most part, I can get myself into some trouble, for sure. But um, I, I, I don't mind a flat. I, I mean, I might I've, on a stone bubble, I might find more of a fold. And I actually don't mind what Kim's saying about a shove. But I think where I'm, I'm leaning most of the time is toward a flat. And Chris, is there a stack size that impacts that decision 
like how, how, how few chips would you have to have before that flat was no longer in your playbook here? Uh, it's less a stack. I mean, it is a stack size, but for me, it's less a stack size. It's more of a relative stack size. So um, I, I like the flat here, given the fact that we are not one of the short stacks here. We're one of the medium stacks, but we're one of the bigger medium stacks. And so we want to be abundantly careful. Uh, like we've talked about earlier, that min caching is important. And so the, the flatting can allow us to do that. But it's also not, um, it's not one where other people can push us around that much. Uh, if we flat off, like if we're the shortest deck at the table and we flat, and even if we have sort of, um, we're on the bubble. We've got even a similar chip stack. We've got like, you know, 20, 18, 20 big blinds, but we're the shortest one by a decent while. Then I'm, I'm probably not taking that approach. Taylor, did you have something there? Yeah, I was going to just add that I'm in the, the call bandwagon here too. I think uh, we get really concerned about, uh, you know, everyone behind us is going to raise us. Um, there's one big stack that's in the small blind it's the worst spot for them they can three bet uh, that's definitely an option um but at the same time they're either folding or flatting a small portion of the time there too so uh if they do come along in the hand and we play multi-way it's not really a spot we want to be in but at least we're limiting our relative risk uh but hopefully and what i'm kind of hoping to get to when i flat here is we flat everyone else folds and it's us versus the under the gun player we both have about relatively the same stack size we both have the same kind of like goals and considerations which is i don't want to bust here i've got a hand that i kind of want to play but i don't want to bust and hopefully uh, you can just find a way to play a small pot hopefully just kind of like run your equity and even if you know there's some betting that goes on you should be able to like identify where you're at with the hand pretty easily with a hand like jacks you're not going to be uh, too confused here so i like a flat and honestly like i'm in the camp that a shove is like really bad here uh i do not like shoving because we are on the stone cold bubble in a large field mtt with jacks it, like best case scenario is we shove everyone folds and we take down a small pot worst case scenario is we get called and now we're uh you know even if we're in a spot where we're 80 20 we someone called us with tens for some odd reason uh, we still have a 20 percent chance of busting here with no chips and when that's the best case scenario i'm, I'm not too happy with it knowing that all the other scenarios are we're getting called by ace king and we're flipping or we're getting called by queens kings aces and we're dominated and we're potentially out of here so if we're not on the stone cold bubble uh i could get behind a shove but just being on the actual bubble here with so much icm pressure underneath us i do not like shoving i don't want to put myself at risk here in any sort of way Let's see what our man, uh, Jonathan Little, has to say about it, and then we'll come back and talk about it on the other side. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a preflop raise or three bet instead? Exactly. What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? This guy's what do you do with ace king when you miss the flop? Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two time World Poker Tour champion and creator of pokercoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at pokercoaching.com slash recpoker right now. I would do it, folks. Head over to rec or <laughs> pokercoaching.com slash recpoker and go sign up, uh, see what Jonathan Little can teach you about poker. I guarantee you it's a lot. So we're coming down to this, uh, and, and we talked before, there's only three ways to play jacks. Every one of them's wrong. I love when we get these disagreements on the show because everyone here brings a different perspective. And especially in cusp hands like this, I think there's often um, you know, different ways to play it that are all good. I think the right, one- and we, we haven't yeah. even talked about the other option, right? We've talked about three options and we haven't even talked about it. Uh, yeah another option that I think is very viable here, which is just fold. Yep. All these people behind us, we're on the bubble, just wait for a different spot and just fold. Like 
obviously it's the boring route to take, but it, it's, it's not that bad. And it goes to show the difference um, that being on the actual bubble makes to this conversation. Like the, the, the extreme amount of ICM pressure, uh, it, it does sort of inform the conversation that we're having um, when it comes to this sort of thing. Rob, did you have something there? I was just going to say, if this is a really large um, MTT online, obviously it's online. Um, and we can see on our table, there's somebody sitting there with seven big blinds. Mm. I would think that there would be, you know, probably a hundred or more players that are going to be making the money in one of these large MTTs like this. So that means there's going to be people at other tables that are going to be have even less big blinds. There's going to be somebody out there with one big blind or two big blinds. So the bubble is going to burst in the next few minutes or so, no matter what you do. So that's where I'm thinking if you just put out a three bet there to eliminate the, the uh, possibility of a squeeze play by the small blind, and if you do that, you're indicating that you have a real hand. So now he's going to have to have something even better. Now, I understand where Kim's coming from that. Yeah, he can put a lot of pressure on us, but we can just fold that and with the assurance that we're still going to have 19 big blinds left. And there's going to be a ton of people out there that are just going to be going out in the next two hands or so. So you're still going to make the money. And Rob, you're basically saying that you, the the tool that we're using here the three bet tool it's meant to be discarded when someone takes that aggressive action when someone that has us covered so it's like yes. um it's like it's like you know that three bet with ace five suited and then the flop comes nine ten jack of the wrong suit um you don't have you don't owe it to yourself to continue just because you tried to use Correct. this tool for one specific use um Correct. but obviously you want to be thinking about is it worth it if I am going to get raised enough, it, often enough? Is it worth it to make that three bet? So that that's going to be very villain dependent, as we as we like to have out here. And it really uh, matters a lot who covers who, doesn't it? Um, because especially if you're going to go post flop, you might play jacks very differently post flop if you're in a hand with someone that covers you versus if you're in a hand with someone that you cover. In a, in a spot like this, you know you're almost set mining with jacks if if you're going to be the short stack post flop and that really changes how you're going to be able to play it post flop as well and you're not going to be taking those bluff lines and that kind of thing so um i think that's a, that's a really good point kim no i was just going to say like my my preferred action is a fold here on the stone mm -hmm. cold bubble mm -hmm. my only reason to go all in was because it is a small buy-in tournament with a small cash and we can put a lot of ICM pressure on the rest of the table by shoving. And so, so we, we get a few comments in the uh, forum post and, and I do encourage our listeners to go get a free rec poker account and uh, go check out the forum yourself. Uh, Cause you can see some excellent uh, responses here. So this one's from Eric Binkley gin. who says I would folded uh, Jack Jack in the spot for several reasons, openers under the gun and covers us. It's the stone cold uh, money bubble busting out of the tournament here would be a disaster. And with a large field, as Rob says earlier, uh, the bubble will not last long. And Binkley says that uh, calling would invite either a multi-way pot or a squeeze, which are tough spots to navigate. And that's true. Um, and that sort of gets to some of the stuff we were talking about here. You'd have to have a sense that you'd have to have a plan for how you were gonna play with this past that pre-flop action. We also get a great comment here from uh, Seven High, who says, understanding that I'm normally seeking advice, not giving it. So take this with a grain of salt. Hey, come on, Seven High. We're all learning here together. That's how it goes. You've got uh, something to contribute. I love it when our premium members and our community members start uh, uh, strategizing with us here. That's what it's all about at Rec Poker. So thank you, Seven High. Um, Seven High says, you, you have the third largest stack with 24 big blinds just barely behind the second stack. Um, the small stack behind you only has five. And with being a min raised to me, I would have definitely called, says seven high uh, 11 here. Even if the small stack shoves behind, I'd still be calling that for the extra five big blinds. Admittedly, I would likely have folded after the flop. 
and we'll get into the flop a little later. Oh, maybe we won't. It's not really relevant, but um, seven highs 11 says, my own humble opinion is that with 25 big blinds, you don't need to play quite so tight on the bubble as if you had a below average stack, which is a great point because you don't, you're not under the same pressure as the short stacks unless you get <laughs> invested in a hand with one of the bigger stacks that can take you out. So that's that kind of line that you don't want to cross with this kind of stuff. Um, seven high 11 also says, I do also recognize that the opener was one of the two stacks larger than you. And they're clearly uh, one of the opponents that you want to avoid on the bubble. I would have called and ended up folding uh, post flop the way it ran out, but he'd be interested to hear other replies. There's one other response I want to read from the forums here, and then I'll open it back up to the panel before we go. Um, this is from Elvita. It says, my understanding is that it depends on a few variables. One, the payout structure. The flatter that it is, the more it makes sense to play tighter as there's less an incentive to take risks as a medium stack, which is a good point because the flatter the structure, the less important it is to get to the top of it and the more important it is to get into the money. Um, two, the range of stacks remaining in the tournament, as this will change the value of the chips remaining in your stack and what you're risking by playing risky. And then three, your desire to win the whole thing versus min caching that you think is a low buy-in tournament. And I think that's a really good point because that's come up in our conversation here as well. You know, we're not poker robots. We're poker players. We're recreational amateurs who enjoy playing poker. So, you know, we're not beholden to taking the most positive EV decision in every point. Part of what we get is the benefit of the pleasure of playing in the tournament. And if we do think, you know, a $10 payoff is not worth it, you know, to, to be disciplined or to, to, to play this kind of grind ICM conscious mentality, then I don't think there is anything wrong with just deciding to make a decision that you're going to aim for the top prize uh, because it sort of matters more to you. But that is a decision that you have to make. But what, what are you trying to get out of the game? Why are you playing? Um, and as Alvita says here, the first two can be calculated. The third is just a personal preference. I think if you decide to play, you should just shove and take advantage of the fold equity or be off to the races. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's easier to do that when you're playing in these online tournaments, right? Because you can just uh, register another one. Um, so we've got so we've got a lot of differing voices in the in the forums too, Chris. Can I, I just want to say one thing about that though, and I think it, it relates to the th uh, what Taylor said, and I think we want to be careful, a little care. I I I I actually agree with this poster, depending on the structure and depending on on the layout. But when we're in these big field tournaments, um, I think there's this sort of myth out there that we either have to play for the win or we're gonna play for the min cash, and there's nowhere in between, right? And I think it's really exceedingly rare in like a thousand player or 2000 player online field. In fact, I don't, it's never happened to me where you're, where you kind of build up a big stack and then just run wire to wire, right? Like you get, you get a 200 big blind stack and you just like, just run over the field. Everyone's fallen over for, you know, and I think there's this sort of myth of like, I'm playing for the win. So I'm going to build this monster stack. Right. And then I'm just going to carry that with me all the way to the win and everyone will bow down before me because nothing ever is going to go wrong for me here. And I think that we want to be, I think a little careful with that line of thinking. I think it's sort of a false uh, sort of line of thinking. And, and what Taylor said earlier really rings true is like, we have a 24 big blind stack here. If we double up, we'll have a 48, maybe 50 big blind stack. Yes, we're now at that point, it's almost a, a lock that we're going to cash this tournament, but it is not a lock that we're going to win it. And so um, there is a much bigger, if we go out of the tournament, however, we put ourselves in a flip, there's a 50% chance that we're going to get zero. And those are really, um, you know, they, they may seem like we're just, oh, we're playing too careful. We're not going for the win. We're, we're being too cautious. We're being too nitty. But it's we're actually playing. I think we want to take those things pretty seriously because we're actually making the right decisions that help us get to the point and carry us to points where we can win. Um, when I have won tournaments, uh, there's always a point in those tournaments where I've been down to like ten big blinds, eleven big blinds, and I've you know found a way back up, and and sort of 
I, I guess the, there's, I think having this myth or this idea that you play for the win and you're just going to have this big stack and just, that's how you're going to actually win a tournament. I don't think that's actually very often true. Yeah. I, I was just thinking too, the, uh, the other thing you have to be a little careful of um People can play poker for whatever reason they want to play poker. But the way you keep score is by the cash in your pocket. So winning money is the way poker is kept score. You could play a game of golf and say, all I want to do is see if I can get the furthest drive. It doesn't matter if it's towards the hole or not, but I want to drive as far as I possibly can. That's not necessarily the way that you are going to get the best golf score. Likewise here, um, the fact that it's a lower stakes tournament shouldn't matter. It should really be when you're playing poker, I mean, other than if the play is different or things like that, if you're playing, it's like how much, how many times you're buying can you get? And whether it's a $5 tournament or a $5 tournament, $500 tournament or a $5,000 tournament, the math is the same for all of those. Uh, other than, you know, there are some things like there might be softer players in the field or other things to consider. But I know I struggle with this, but it's best to try to play the proper decision, no matter what stakes you're playing at. All right. So let me ask this. So say we uh, have just broke, the bubble just broke on the hand before. And these are the exact same scenarios of the exact same chip stacks. And we've got all this talk about going for first and how much your stack is worth and all of that. Is how are you playing this differently? Great question. So without the ICM pressure or without the same ICM pressure after the bubble burst is another one of those moments where there's very, very little ICM pressure at all. So in, in that kind of a situation, Obviously, we're less worried about busting. And so I think it would be, I think we would take folding right out of the equation. And the question would just be whether we were going to raise, shove, or call. Um, I think Jax is a good enough hand that even against under the gun, we'd probably want to be raising. I, I, I don't know, gangs anyone here? Feel like there's a call I think, option in the. I think I still I still raise. I just wouldn't fold now. Right, right. <laughs> you right. know, I wouldn't fold to a bigger stack now. Yeah. Um. So I think I would play it exactly the same, other than the <laughs> fact I wouldn't fold. Yeah. Yeah, you're less worried about busting, right? And I think Chris Chris uh, feels similarly because he's doing the. Our, our YouTube uh, viewers will be able to tell that he's pushing those chips right into the middle there. Um, which is yeah. a, which is usually a good way to play jacks. Yeah, Taylor. Then the other thing to consider is okay. Now, if we are just in the money, uh, there's a lot of short stacks yeah. at the table too. Can we potentially incentivize them to sh shove and we kind of do a trappier call type of play, which I think is viable. My first inclination was three bet, kind of the way I'd normally play the hand, but there's probably some merit to calling and trying to trap a short stack into thinking they're making a squeeze play and we're sitting there with jacks. So yeah, it, I think the ultimate answer is just that we're probably not going to end up folding a lot in this spot. That's a great point. Uh, whether we call it or raise it, and we weren't sure in the other situation, which one of those we necessarily preferred, but we were, we were definitely considering folding more now uh, take removing that ICM pressure I think there's still going to be a good argument for the calling or the raising, but we're basically saying that we're just not going to be folding in this case. And I think, you know, players that get past the bubble more frequently, once, once players have played enough tournaments that they've gotten past the bubble routinely, um, you will see people starting to get very frisky. They've, they've made the money now. And a lot of these short stacks are not even trying to win the tournament necessarily at this point. Um, they've already won the tournament that they were trying to win which was uh, bursting the bubble with their five to 10 big blinds or something like that. And now they just want to roll the dice and see if you can beat ace 10. Um, and in that case, you know, you probably should tailor your strategy a little bit more to how you can get, uh, how you can get into hands with these players. So 
again, it's very player dependent, but I think that's a, that's a good, that's a good mindset to be taking into this. Any other thoughts on uh, how to play Jack Jack preflop? <laughs> it is a complicated, uh, it's a complicated question. All right. Well, seeing none, I'd like to thank Chris, Rob, John, Kim, and Taylor. Of course, Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino. And Chapo, and all you, the listeners. Thanks again. Thanks.